thank you all for coming to this uh, meeting with the uh, Secretary General of Interpol, Ronald Noble. As you know, uh, he came here 14 years ago when he was coming up as the Secretary General of Interpol. That is when Iceland uh, held the, uh, the uh, European Conference of Interpol. That was in the year 2000, in May 2000. He made uh, a pledge during that time to uh, visit all the uh, uh, 190, today 190 countries of, of Interpol. And by uh, visiting uh, Iceland today, he has completed that particular circle. So he has visited 190 Interpol countries, and this is his last visit as the Secretary General of Interpol. It is a great pleasure for us, the Icelandic police, of course, to, to welcome him and his entourage to Iceland and uh, give you, the press, the opportunity to address him with your questions and interviews. And uh, I thought that uh, it was a, a excellent uh, opportunity for right. us to, to, right. to show also the, the press the unity of the Icelandic police right. and the international uh, police community. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Harold. Thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> so as uh, Harold mentioned, when I first came here in 2000 in May, I was just the uh, executive committee candidate to become secretary general. And the world was far different back in May of 2000 than what it is now. But uh, as was just said, I promised that if confirmed and if re-elected, I would eventually make it to all Interpol member countries, which I'm, I'm doing today and completing the circle, um, as Heraldor said. First, let me say the cooperation between Interpol and the Icelandic police force is as strong as it could be. Um, this country is a great country, low crime rate, very educated population, very well-trained and educated police force. Um, really, really a, a pleasure uh, to visit. In terms of crimes affecting you know, this country, when I was just speaking to Harold and others, as I go around the world and see the world changing, it's this concern we all have about uh, cyber crime and cyber thefts and cyber threats. And that's something where you can be hit from anywhere in the world at any time, and uh, your banking, financial institutions, businesses, and citizens have to be um, prepared for it. Interpol's created this Interpol Global Complex for Innovation, focusing on cyber crime and cyber security. It's our goal to share information with Iceland and other countries concerning the MO, the techniques that these organized crime groups are using for, for their targeted cyber attacks. Um, other than that, from a you know, world security perspective or crime threat perspective, you know, you're in a safe country, a great country. And as I said, it's a pleasure, pleasure to visit. Be happy to answer any specific questions you might have about uh, Interpol or about Interpol's relationship with, with Iceland. And <clears throat> I should note that uh, uh, this is the most senior and longest serving commissioner of police in the world. Um, I thought I would outsurvive him, but I have not. Um, my term ends in November 7th uh, uh, of this year, but um, your commissioner has a reputation that he's gained worldwide for being a professional who never allows politics or anything other than the rule of law to, to um, drive his decision making. And so I just wanted to say it's an, it's an honor to, to have come here when you were commissioner young and to leave when you're still a young commissioner. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions you might have? How are the Icelandic police prepared for cybercrimes? All of us are trying to get more and more prepared um, because it takes longer for legislation to be put in place because citizens are rightly concerned about uh, data protection and their personal privacy. You have to be very careful in what you're structuring. And so we are all um, not where we should be because the attacks come much faster than the defenses. But with the global complex for um, cybersecurity and cybercrime that we just opened on, on October 1st of this year, we hope to become more prepared than we are. And, and again, this is something that, that I speak as, as Secretary General and say that it's something all countries need to be concerned about because it's so expensive to build up cyber defenses and it's so easy for innocent citizens to be deceived um, and allow the cyber criminals into their uh, 
uh, personal finances. Thank you. <clears throat> There's been a lot of discussion globally on the war on drugs, especially after this report came out led by Mr. Kofi Annan a couple of years ago. Uh, what, what are your views on that? Um, uh, has the war on drugs been a failure globally? Do we need new measures? Yeah. So we have 190 member countries, uh, Interpol, and uh, we're uh, a country uh, organization where we believe one country, one vote. We have no security council, no right to veto. And each of our countries is a sovereign. They decide, and their citizens decide, what kind of laws they want with regard to, uh, to drugs. We know that uh, there are many, many, many uh, organized crime groups, uh, transnational organized crime groups, that uh, traffic in a variety of drugs, and they use a host of you know, violent crimes, threats, and extortion in order to reap tremendous profits. Interpol's view is that when those countries seek those individuals to be arrested um, and those individuals flee internationally, Interpol should help uh, alert other countries and help have those people arrested. <clears throat> On a local basis, a national basis, we know that countries around the world are beginning to focus more on uh, demand reduction and uh, to lower the penalties for drug trafficking at the use level in order to free up space in prisons and to try to deal with the problem uh, differently. So I believe it's very important for the world uh, not to judge uh, any country that's trying to focus on demand reduction as opposed to classic enforcement and share that knowledge and that experience around the world. Thank you. It's a matter for the sovereign, as you mentioned, but does it impose problems for Interpol or make the work more complex enforcing uh, <coughs> the provisions globally <coughs> yeah. when individual countries are taking measures and then we see individual states within the United States um, Classic legislations, um, liberal legislations, um, yeah. when it comes to yeah. um, uh, for the use of marijuana, for example. Yeah. So that's a fair question, and in, in, in answering it, I'll explain a little bit about how Interpol works. So we have 190 member countries, and the sovereign country decides whether someone in that country or who's gone through that country um, is wanted for arrest. Right. So. If that satisfies our standards, that it's not political, not military, not religious, not racial in nature, we then publicize that around the world. Then the receiving country of this notification has to decide, is the country that's requesting arrest in a country we have an extradition treaty with? Is it a country that we collaborate with? Is the offense that's being prosecuted one that would be offense in our country? So actually, when applying it on an individual basis, uh, it's not a problem because each sovereign country decides whether or not uh, to enforce another country's request for arrest. But from a policy perspective, which is the question you asked me in the beginning, it's very difficult for me as Secretary General to articulate a global policy. I can do it for terrorism, I can do it for foreign fighters, but for drug trafficking, I can't do it. <coughs> Would you consider Iceland a re relatively safe co country against uh, terrorism? I'd say I consider it a safe country, one of the safest countries in terms of all forms of crime, including, including terrorism. I can't understand why it took me 14 years to come back here. <laughs> it's so safe. And as, I, as you can imagine, when I'm, when I'm uh, making a, a mission, my staff prepares threat assessment, uh, a crime assessment and an assessment of the policing. And when I read my materials, and of course I'm, I'm fairly up to speed with, uh, with the crime issues in, in Iceland, I'm reminded of an issue that's even more delicate than drug trafficking in the country I come from. I'm, I'm an American citizen. It's the issue of gun control, gun rights. And you know that in the U.S. Uh, there's a huge debate about whether an arms an armed population can be a safe population. And when you look at the number of people who own arms in your country and how few crimes there are related to arms in this country, you see it's very possible. I think the death rate here is, I think it's like 1.8 for per 100,000, and in my country I think it's 5.8. So it is a very safe country to be in. So armed citizen is in principle a bad thing in your opinion? Yeah. Uh, whoa, 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 whoa. I only hear this here. Armed citizenry yeah. is, a, is in principle a bad thing. No, I think it's in principle a very good thing. Yeah, and and, and uh, an, no, armed, an armed law-abiding yeah. citizenry is, I believe, uh, a very important principle that is held uh, very, very 
closely in my country and I believe in this country as well. Yeah, but you mentioned earlier that uh, we have very few guns here and we have low level of violence. I mean, we don't have, people don't own guns really, it's only like hunters. So, you no, I didn't. We should tighten gun control even more. No, I, listen, two things I didn't say so far. One, I didn't say you had few guns here. I thought the opposite. I thought hunting was a very important part of life for citizens here. And I thought there were about 200,000 guns in circulation um, in this country for hunting-related activities. So I, made, I, I didn't make any statement about uh, there being few guns. And I wanted to make the statement that this country proves you can have a large number of guns in circulation in relation to the population and still have a safe country. My name is uh, Helgeson from the State Broadcaster. Yes. Um, I was wondering, you were speaking in Paris uh, a few days ago on the da database for foreign fighters. Uh, uh, this is a relatively new database, correct? Yes. Um, how, how does it work? And is this something that Iceland could in <coughs> participate or is part participating? Well, Iceland is participating in, in the following way. Um, Foreign fighters and terrorists and other dangerous transnational criminals use stolen passports and crossing borders. If they use their own identity, that increases the likelihood of their being caught, so they use stolen um, or counterfeit passports. Our database has 43 million of these passports and is screened about 800 million times in Iceland. Screening of our database is such that virtually every person that comes in the country or comes through the country now has his or her passport screened, so you're able to reduce the likelihood of having um, foreign fighters or any other terrorists come here. Secondly, Iceland has a very integrated police database network. And so police officers who have smartphones and iPads and will consult the police databases will very easily consult Interpol databases as well. So what we're trying to do for Interpol is we're building a database of the actual foreign fighters, those who are named and wanted for arrest, we create notices for them, what we call red notices. We have foreign fighters who are under investigation but not yet wanted for arrest. We have what are called green notices, which alerts member countries that when this person comes into the country, be careful, watch the person. He's under investigation for being a foreign fighter. And then those foreign fighters or terrorists who you've stolen or lost travel documents that are in our database, um, Iceland screens them on a regular basis. So there's cooperation, uh, Iceland is cooperating with this? Uh, yes, yes, very very, very closely. Has this database been uh, successful, uh, successfully, success, successfully used in apprehending any foreign fighters recently? Or, or I, I don't want to, want to uh, um, answer anything about an ongoing investigation except to say that the database in our country's use of this database has alerted countries to foreign fighters seeking to enter a country or inside a country. One of the reasons why this uh, approach, Interpol's approach, is a good approach is is that if the screening occurs at the border, you can simply not let the person come into the country or go through the country without making an arrest. And since September 11th of 2001, the focus on law enforcement to fight terrorism has been to prevent and disrupt and thwart and not necessarily just arrest. Thank you. Um, and uh, these foreign fighters, they are for, for various nationalities. Yes. And uh, has that, that been a surprising result to see how many nationalities have been involved in it's shocking. It's a shock, not just a surprising result, it's a shocking result, especially when we think about the foreign fighters linked to, to the terrorist group that, that we term the cowardly murderers. Um, you think about people who grew up in societies that are well-educated, where the rule of law is respected, um, coming from what you consider good backgrounds, and yet being tempted or deciding to align themselves with groups that murder and uh, terrorize the way that these groups do, it's, it's, shock, it's shocking, it should shock all of us. There have been reports about uh, large numbers from Scandinavian countries. Has that uh, also, has that gathered some focus? I know that in, in Norway, for example, there, there have been discussions about uh, relatively large groups of Norwegians taking part in fighting in Syria and in Iraq. Because of, you know, my perspective is global, so I would, rather than saying Scandinavian, I would say Western Europe, North America, um, Australia, uh, countries where you wouldn't expect um, foreign fighters to be coming from, coming from uh, in large numbers. And one of the issues that societies and governments are
considering now is, is, is uh, how do you respect the citizen's right to travel while at the same time reducing likelihood that the citizen's going to travel in order to join a terrorist group. And that's something each sovereign country has to decide for itself what measures to put in place. Some countries, when the threshold of suspicion reaches a certain level, they're saying that the citizen is not going to be allowed to travel internationally. Um, that's a way to try to, to try to limit it. So I, I don't want to focus my answer only on the Nordic countries. I'd, I'd say on, on you know, Western Europe, uh, North America, Australia, those are areas that really are surprising when you look at the numbers of foreign terrorists um, coming out of those, those regions. Uh, since the uh, economic collapse, uh, how closely have you worked, worked with uh, Icelandic police? I'm going to be careful in what I'm saying now because I've been reading about the recovery in Iceland being quite strong in comparison to, to mainland Europe. So I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that the smiles I've seen since landing are smiles because economic recovery is being felt, felt here. But we've been working with Icelandic police during my entire 14 years very closely. And one thing that's clear is when there are difficult economic times, sometimes economic crimes increase and therefore the cooperation um, has to be quite close, and the consultation of our databases um, has been consistently high, and to be quite candid, the response from Interpol has been consistently low in terms of hits, that is, where people are being investigated in Iceland, if they're not known to police anywhere else in the world, that means it comes back negative. That's, that's a good thing. That's like going through a metal detection device in an airport. The goal is for the red light not to go off, and for Iceland, uh, the consultations of our database, for the most part, results in good information that the people that they're investigating are not wanted for uh, criminal conduct. But when they are, it's like finding a needle in a haystack. Um, Interpol's responses they help Icelandic police. <clears throat> well, if there are no further questions, uh, Mr. Nobles is uh, sorry. Maybe be, be, before, before you ask this, this is my last uh, press conference as Secretary General in a member country, and, and this is true what I'm telling you. In every press interview I've ever held in any country, the last question has always been painful for me. <laughs> always, consistently. It's always that last question, so you can change the tide by asking a friendly question. <laughs> this is a friendly question. Uh, what are you most proud of since you started uh, in your office? Yeah. Very good question. Yeah, yeah. You can ask two questions, first like that. Um, when I first became Secretary General, uh, we had only 179 countries, and only 163 of those countries were connected to our police communication system. We didn't have internet communication at all. It was really, really a close, close circle. And now, as I sit before you, any police officer in the world um, can be connected to Interpol by inserting a, a certain code, a certain number, by scanning a device, by going to using a laptop or um, any other computer terminal. So the connectivity is one thing I'm very excited about. In the beginning of, of uh, my tenure as Secretary General, we only reached a few thousand people per year, and we only had uh, a few million searches per year. Now, last year, we had over a billion searches. And the final point that I'm most proud of is that you see me wearing this wristband called Turn Back Crime. So we started from a network of Interpol offices. We expanded to police around the world having access. And now we have this campaign where we're asking citizens around the world to help Interpol and police come up with ways that they can prevent crime. And the more that we do this, we're having, you know, um, we've had the support from His Holiness the Pope, Ban Ki-moon. We've got uh, Lionel Messi, Juventus, a Ferrari, and then we've got Shah Rukh Khan, and then we have these eighth graders and seventh graders and students from Singapore and around the world who are writing about ways in which their friends can stay safer on the internet. So the idea that Interpol will become a reality to individuals in the street, citizens, students, not just what they see in the movies or read in books, which I love, by the way, um, but a reality is, is probably what's made me proudest. On that note. Thank you. Thank you very much.